Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Celebrate Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month with Random House Children's Books. I'm Sarah Hunter, editor of the Books for Youth section at Booklist. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical details. The audience is in listen-only mode, but we welcome any questions you may have. On the bottom of your screen is a toolbar with a section for Q&A. If you have a question or need technical assistance, simply click Q&A and type your message into the box that appears. We will do our best to respond to all tech-related questions, and we will pass along all other questions to today's panelists so they can follow up with you after the webinar. Also, Booklist offers closed captioning on all webinars. To enable or disable captions on your screen, please look for and click the live transcript icon on the toolbar mentioned above. From there, you can select show or hide subtitles from the menu that appears. If you choose to enable subtitles, you can adjust the size of the captions at any time by selecting subtitle settings. Last but not least, a link to today's title list was included in the reminder email you received from Zoom one hour ago. To download it, please open that email, scroll to the bottom, and click on the link located there. You can also download the title list by copying the URL on this screen into your web browser. Today, we are joined by Carla Reina Spilenti, author of Loteria, publishing September 7th from Knopf, Knopf Books for Young Readers, Aureli Morales, author of Aureli is a Dreamer, which published June 8th from Random House Studio, and Jose Pimienta, author of Suncatcher, uh, which published May 19th, 2020 from Random House Graphic. Before we kick off our panel conversation, we'll first hear from each of these amazing creators about their most recent titles. First up is Carla Arenas Valenti. Carla writes stories for and about kids, taking readers on journeys steeped in magical realism and philosophical questions. Her storytelling is heavily influenced by her Mexican heritage and layered with ideas and concepts she's picked up in her many travels around the world. She currently resides in the Chicagoland area with her husband and three kids, two cats, and hundreds of books. Carla writes picture books. She is the creator of the My Super Science Hero series. Loteria is her debut middle grade novel. Take it away, Carla. Hi, and thank you for that introduction. And thank you everybody for joining us. I am so excited to be here kicking off the Latinx Hispanic Heritage Month. So thank you. Um, a little bit about myself, as you mentioned, I am originally from Mexico, born and raised. Although I have since lived in many countries that I think have influenced my writing and my personal development, I suppose. I've lived in France, I've lived in Japan. Most recently, I spent six years in Germany. That's actually where I wrote Loteria. And uh, the book Loteria is actually, I like to call it a philosophical discourse about free will versus determinism, packaged as a middle grade novel. So the core question at the heart of the story was whether or not we have free will, whether or not we have the ability to make our own choices. And I wanted to present that in a story format that would be accessible to readers young and old, but that would actually make it easy to consume and think about these, these big themes and these big questions. So the story itself starts off with life and death walking into Oaxaca City, Mexico. And these are two friends who have known each other for eternity, of course. They're best friends and they meet every year to play a game of Loteria. So for those of you who may not know, Loteria is a little bit like bingo, although instead of numbers, what we have are icons. So you have your, your cards and they have little pictures on them. It's a tree, it's a rose, it's a ladder. And each of these cards is also represented in a board, a 16 uh, grid board. And so you have a cantor who will pull a card and utter a riddle. The riddle is supposed to represent the image on the card. And then if you have that on your tabla, you will put a little token on it, a frijol, a black bean. And the first person to get four in a row wins the game. So life and death meet every year to play this game. But they're not just playing the game. They have chosen a child to be a pawn. If life wins the game, this child, our heroine Clara, who you can see in the beautiful illustration on the cover by Dana Sanmar, so Clara will receive a long life. If death wins, Clara will be sent into her domain. So the stakes are very, very high, especially for young Clara, who is oblivious to all of this going on in her life. And so the two friends begin to play the game. They flip the card. And as these cards are turned over and these images are displayed, the images begin to unfold in Clara's life. 
So everything that pops up somehow becomes an event that shapes her. And the question that I am asking the readers is, are all these things that are happening to Clara driven by these cards? Are they being shaped by life and death? Or does it, she have a measure of choice in designing her own fate? And so hopefully I've done a good job of not answering that question, but actually presenting both sides and allowing the readers to come to their own conclusion to help along the way life and death actually debate free will. So they both have different positions on the matter. Life believes that humans have free will, that of course we have the choice to shape our destiny. And death, not surprisingly, believes that everything is inevitable. And so they present their arguments and they play the game and life presents his arguments and death presents her arguments and it leads up to a climax, which also coincides with the climax of Clara's story. And to all of our surprise, and I say all of us because I put myself in the, in the book with life and death, Clara actually took the story in a direction that none of us were expecting. And when I started writing the book, I was pretty sure I knew where I stood on the issue of free will versus determinism. As I wrote the book, my mind kept changing with these, uh, these debates. And then when we got to this climax, I, I felt trapped. I know life and death felt trapped. And fortunately, our heroine saved us all and pulled us out of this big conundrum. So I won't tell you how she did it. Hopefully, you'll all read it. But that's a little bit of a nutshell of my book, Loteria. Thank you so much, Carla. We'll now hear from Aureli Morales. Aureli was born in Puebla, Mexico, but was raised in New York City. She is a DACA recipient, and Aureli is a dreamer as her debut children's book. A graduate of SUNY Brooklyn College with a bachelor's degree in childhood bilingual education, she currently works as a substitute teacher. One day, Aureli hopes to have her own classroom where she can teach children to value the power of storytelling and empower them to share their own stories. She lives in Brooklyn, New York with her family. Welcome, Aureli. The floor is yours. Hi everyone, thank you Sarah so much for that wonderful introduction. I'm so excited to be here to kick off Latinx uh, Hispanic, Hispanic Heritage Month. And so, as we mentioned, it's my book is Areli's a Dreamer. It is a true story and it tells my own immigration story and my experience being a child of two worlds. I was born in a beautiful small town in Puebla, Mexico and at the age of six, I left behind my home, my family there, and especially my abuelita to be reunited with my parents and older brother that were living in, the, in New York City here in the United States. In this book, I pack years of experience as a young undocumented child, starting from my joyous life and loving life in Mexico and my life disrupting migration to this country and then adjusting to my new life in America. It feels absolutely magical and surreal to have my story documented in the picture book and it, for it to be just gorgeously illustrated by Luisa Oliva, as you can see from the cover, I just, I can't believe that's me. Um, Luisa, she's a Colombian illustrator and she has illustrated many wonderful picture books, including Your Name is a Song, a picture book that shows the importance of your name, right? And how it's beautiful that it reflects, how it reflects your culture. I think the pairing of my words and Lisa's illustration beautifully captures the hardships, the lessons of, in, in, of my immigration story. And while I was writing this book, I thought about my experience as an undocumented immigrant. Part of that experience is living life trying to be invisible, living in the shadows and feeling voiceless. For many years, I couldn't share my story because I feared separation and deportation. I didn't have the privilege to share my story. But after obtaining DACA, I, I felt like it was my responsibility to share my story. I was tired of feeling invisible. I was tired of the xenophobia and the lack and often negative portrayal of Mexicans in the media and books. So as it says in the cover, this is the first book written by a DACA recipient. And those who may not know, DACA is an immigration policy. It stands for Deferred Action for Child Arrivals. It is a temporary and exclusive immigration policy that provides relief to thousands of undocumented immigrants that came to the United States as children, just like me, and call this country home. 
Um, this policy was enacted in 2012 by the Obama administration, but this is the result of many years of activism of many brave undocumented folks and allies who have worked for years to make sure that undocumented immigrants in this country have rights and possibly a pathway to citizenship. And so, I, like I mentioned before, it is a privilege to have DACA. It is a privilege to be able to share my story. And I hope that this story inspires many others to share their own stories because that's how we move forward. That's how we change the world and that's how we change policies, right? Because I think that undocumented immigrants, just like me, who have names, who have hopes, who have dreams, deserve to live in this country with dignity and without fear. So I hope that you share this book, especially in your classrooms. It is also available in Spanish. It's titled Areli es una dreamer. So um, it's a very personal book and it's special because it's my story and just happy to share it with the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arbeli. Uh, next up is Jose Pimienta. Jose was raised in Mexicali, Baja, California, and now resides in Los Angeles, California, where they work on comics and storyboards for animation and film. Suncatcher was their debut author illustrator graphic novel. Twin Cities, coming next summer, is their first middle grade graphic novel. In their stories, they focus on the importance of Latinx culture and the experience of growing up on the border. Thank you for joining us, Jose. Do, 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 do. Hi, can everyone hear me? Oh. Yes, we can hear you. Great. Uh, just uh, I, I hope that works as an as, as an interesting pause. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank again. Th uh, thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, and also thank you so much for having me in this event. And thank you for everyone who's attending. Uh, I hope you are having fun. Uh, so yes, my name is Jose Pimienta. I grew up in Mexicali, and. Um, Suncatcher is the story of Beatrice, a teenager who discovers that her grandfather's soul is trapped in a guitar. Uh, it takes place in Mexicali in the early 2000s. And the only way for her to break the spell is by playing the song that her grandfather never got to write. Uh, and yeah, so it's a story that it took a very long time for me to write because for most of my career, I've, uh, I have been working with other writers and other artists in other fields such as film and animation and what have you. Um, so when it came into actually writing my own stuff, uh, there was just a lot of learning that I had to do in, in terms of prose and pacing, things that I was not very familiar with, but that I was very comfortable doing visually. Uh, and also it was just like a story that I didn't know it was going to get that personal for me as I was developing because uh, I also grew up very heavily influenced by all sorts of music. Um, growing up in the border, we used to get uh, both like a lot of uh, a lot of American influence from American television and also a lot of American radio. But also being in Mexico, you know, we would get a lot of you know a, a lot of Mexican artists coming in for concerts, and we would also just have like you know well a lot of Mexican bands passing by. And the reason that Suncatcher takes place in Mexicali is because when I was writing it, I started talking to uh, other musicians just to, you know, do my research and whatnot. And eventually I started, you know, talking to a lot of friends who were also musicians. And that's how I ended up discovering that the story that I wanted to tell was also a story that I, that I had also gone through myself, which is this moment in time in Mexicali where there were a lot of teenage bands who were doing their own shows you know, very, very DIY. Um, and, you know, this was a time where uh, music was just something that all teenage, we, we as teenagers were doing uh, straight out of just for a hobby and playing show and, you know, making our own shows just because we could. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of how it, it, it came about. And it was a Kickstarter project until eventually it got picked up by Random House Graphic. And this is the, uh, the hardcover. Uh, and once Random House Graphic picked it up, uh, we did a, few, a couple of additions and a few extra revisions. Um, but uh, most of the stories that remained the same. Uh, everything in the story is um, uh, uh, a wonderful collaboration. And uh, yeah, I'm very happy with it. And currently I am working on other projects that also take place in Mexicali. Um, well, because it's a, it's a city that I hold very dear. And even though I don't live there anymore, 
um, it still uh, it still holds a very special place in my heart. Thank you so much, Jose. And a big thanks to all of you for your insightful presentations. Uh, from here, we'll now begin the panel portion of the webinar. You can all enable your video once more, and I will turn on mine so you can see my face too, and then we'll get started. Okay. So we're going to jump right into the questions here. Um, and I wanted to start with one for all of you. Um, all of your books feel very strongly tied to a place or location. And I'd like you all to each talk about how you went about cultivating such a powerful sense of that location and what makes that location so meaningful to your stories. Um, so Carla, why don't we start with you on this one? So the setting of Oaxaca actually came about quite by accident. Uh, my brother happened to get married in Oaxaca City, so we went to the wedding and I had never been there, so we decided to make a trip out of it and we spent a week just exploring the, the town. Um, and Oaxaca is, is absolutely mesmerizing. It is this incredible blend of pre-Columbian art and architecture and history and traditions in this very modern and contemporary setting. And walking down those streets was an immersion in, in magic and myth. It was just, we were swept away. You could all but hear the voices of the past whispering in your ears as you visit Montalban or you go to the Arbol de Tule or you walk through these markets where they sell alebrijes and chapulines and calaveras de azúcar. And it was just, it was mesmerizing. And so when we came back from visiting uh, Oaxaca, I had all of these visions and, and thoughts in my head and it was just so easy for it to spill into the pages of the book. It, it almost it feels a little bit like cheating to say that I came up with the setting because all I had to do was just record it authentically. Oaxaca did all that by itself. Um, Jose, I wonder if you could chime in next. You touched a little bit um, on this when you were talking about your book, but can you speak a little bit about how you cultivate a strong sense of location? Yeah, so um, not to, uh, uh, so, by the way, I, I long to visit Oaxaca, uh, but uh, yeah, so when I was writing Suncatcher, well, let me go step back a little bit. For me, it's also just the location where a story is going to take place. For me, it's uh, it's it has to be a character in it of itself. Like I want it to be a character in it of itself. Uh, so when I was writing Suncatcher and I was, you know, very, very determined to to set it in Mexicali, uh, I wanted to capture what is it about Mexicali that makes it, you know, a special city. and. To me, Mexicali is one of these places that it's like, it's a clash of, you know, both American pop culture, but also Mexicali in and of itself is a very young city. Like it's, it, it only was founded in like the late 19th century, which compared to the rest of Mexico is barely a toddler, right? Um, but adding to that history is that Mexicali saw a lot of migrations from, from other Mexicans coming into the region in order to develop it. That's a longer story, but just to bring my point is that Mexicali is one of these cities where it's a, it's a melting pot of a lot of people coming together to well, live and, and make a life. Um, and I think that that also kind of blended itself into the story of forming a band, which is, you know, like it's a bunch of teenagers or kids who, whether or not they are having fun at school, they also want to do something else, something, you know, something more expressive. Um, so capturing that, um, it also made me both reminisce, but also pay more attention to what is it about Mexicali that makes it, that makes it unique or special for that matter. You know, where, what are their festivities and what are, you know, where are locations where, even though it's a, relatively small city, uh, it still has monuments and it still has, you know, it, it still has a sense of place. So, uh, yeah, it's, and I like drawing that, so. Interesting, <laughs> <laughs> that's like, a, it feels a little bit like the opposite of what Carla just said, because Mexicali sounds so new and Oaxaca has this like history to it. It's really interesting. Um, and Aureli, you talk, you have two places in your book that, that feel very important to you. I wonder if you could speak to this question a little bit as well. Before I talk about those two places, I wanna mention Oaxaca. Oaxaca is also very special to me. As a DACA recipient, you can apply for something called advanced parole, which allows you to leave the country with permission. Um, and I happened to go to Oaxaca for a study abroad program and I just fell in love with Oaxaca city and the culture and it just, I reconnected with my 
Yeah. And the food. Yes, exactly. The food. Um, and I reconnected with my, my, my roots in Mexico because for so many years I wasn't allowed to go back to Mexico. And so, yeah, so my story takes place in two, two places, um, my small town in Puebla and New York city. And they're so different. Right. Um, and most of it was based on my memories. And for me, my hometown, my memories are like beautiful memories of having fun, running around in the open spaces, chasing chickens, you know, dinner with, with a huge family, like, right. We would sit around at seven o'clock, six o'clock and eat dinner together. And then New York city was different. It was, um, it's busier, um, noisier. I was like surprised that, um, people lived in like one building, like lots of people lived in one building and it was so different. So, and I think one way that that we capture these two different places were through the illustrations. And I think Luisa just did a beautiful job at capturing those, those places that I call home. And you can definitely see that in the cover, like the warm tones of, of my small town and like the fireworks of, and the skyline of New York City. So I think that I owe it to Luisa who, who did a wonderful job at, at capturing um, my two hometowns. Yeah, that's great. I noticed that too, like the color palettes are really distinct in both of those locations and you really get a strong sense of atmosphere from both portions of your story. Um, so Carla, I'm gonna head back to you on this one. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about magic realism and how that's influenced your work and specifically how magical realism is different from fantasy because it is not the same thing. Yeah, and it's a good question because I think there's a lot of confusion and overlap between the two concepts. So I will not pretend to be an expert on this. And what, I, what I'm about to say is really just my own version of it. But one, one good way to think about it, and a lot of people think of magical realism as a subset of fantasy. Some people think of it on a spectrum. Other people just think of them as completely different genres. I think a good way to visualize it is that magical realism takes place in reality, in the day-to-day, -day, ordinary, boring, mundane life that we lead every day, but there's an element of magic that exists within it that is taken as a given fact. It's, it's not confusing, the authors don't even explain it. It is part and parcel of living your day-to-day. -day. Now, fantasy, on the other hand, it tends to be a, a new reality that you've created, an imaginary world that has its own unique set of rules. And so, of course, there's going to be some overlap, right? And when you're talking about magic, it's, it's like, well, what are we, is it fantasy? Is it a new set of rules or is it within the context of your day-to-day? -day? Uh, so I'll, I'll give you a couple examples because in Loteria, I actually do a little bit of both. So one example of magical realism would be the fact that you have life and death as walking, breathing entities walking through town and nobody questions it. And there they are and they're doing their thing, but they are life and death. You have a tree, El Arbol del Tule, who devours a piece of paper that has a dragon on it. And then that dragon becomes a part of the tree. And of course it does, of course that happens. You have an old woman who receives a bouquet of marigolds and then she's transformed into a youthful woman for a day. Nobody questions it. It's a fact of living in Oaxaca City when life and death are coming by. But then you have Ajean, which is this magical land that Clara enters through a nopal. And it's a completely imaginary world. It has its own set of rules. It has its own mystical creatures that I invented. And even though there's also the Kingdom of Las Posas, and the Kingdom of Las Posas is based on a real surrealistic park that exists in the jungle. But the kingdom of Las Posas in my story is completely fantastical and made up. And so I think that's a good way to think about it. And actually, Jose, you, you brought up, I, I was so intrigued by the concept of your story, right? El, el abuelo, like him trapped in the guitar. That's a perfect example of magical realism because the, I hear that and I think, yeah, that could totally happen. I grew up believing in all of these things. I grew up thinking I had, you know, Chanek is living in my closet. And that was a fact of my life. I had a tree in my house when I grew up and it did not at all surprise me that there might be nature sprites, right? And so magical realism, I think is not just 
a genre in storytelling, it's almost kind of the way we live our lives. By we, I might just mean me, but maybe other people, right? But that's, I think that to me is the key distinction, right? It's, it's, it's seated, it's grounded in your reality as opposed to fantasy, which is sort of grounded up here. Um, Jose, you're nodding a lot as Carla is talking. I wonder if yeah, you have any it's thoughts a, to add. Well, yeah, it's a, uh, if I will, can, can I add just something to, because uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything that Carla is saying. And yeah, like th there is something about magical realism where it's like, it's it's almost environmental. It's if like, it's if, it's not so much that magic is, 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 is an element, but rather magic just is part yes. of, the, magic yes. just is on the in, in the world whether or not it may be wielded or not, it's just a circumstance of our surroundings. Um, and yeah, like there's also like a, a philosophical aspects to it that it's like, that, that it's not so much the way that we're accustomed to hearing about fantasy, which is predominantly, you know, whether you're Western European or, or, or American at that point. And it, again, no dis or anything, but there is something about magical realism where it's just, it's, it's almost a voice of nature that just exists and we've been accepting it because that's, those are the circumstances for the, that surround us. And it's comforting in that sense, but yeah, it's, sorry. It's, no, and I love that you added the comforting because it, it is so comforting to live in a world where that is part of your reality. To be able to draw on that, yeah. Interesting. Um, Jose, my, my next question is for you. I'm going to return to you again, if you don't mind. Um, your uh, book is heavily about music, and I'm very interested in how you approach illustrating sound. Um, yeah, so there, it's, I mean, I wish I could say that, you know, it's, uh, it's, it all just came to me. No, it's, uh, it was a very deliberate choice. Uh, for sure, and uh, you know, for anyone who has not read Suncatcher, the, this is a blue, like a little bit of a spoiler. Uh, in the book, there's never any description of what of what the music it is that they're playing. Like, I never say what kind of genre it is. I never say well what the lyrics are, like, because that's really not the point. The point is to visually convey the emotion that music gives us, and um, uh, and this is something that. I don't know where it came from, but like, I think maybe it's just because of how much music has been an influence, but more than good drawings, I've always been, t uh, I used to be told that my drawings had a lot of energy to them, that they just looked like very sketchy and very expressive. Um, and I think it was during college at some point where this cartoonist, hi Cal, uh, where this cartoonist said that they really liked the way that I drew bands because it made them look like they were really playing. Uh, so I just kind of took that and like honed that. So. Uh, I try to keep that as like as a consistent focus that if if someone is making music, well, I'm pretty sure it goes without saying that everybody loves music. Music makes us feel a lot of things. Music is essential, you know, primal even. And there's always an you know, th th there's always something intangible. So translating that visually was well, that was the task and. You know, depending on, you know, we all have, whoever has an iTunes visualizer will see like how sometimes music responds. So it was taking a lot of those elements and looking at music videos and just looking at cover art and just, you know, looking at different images and just be like, well, what does that sound like? Uh, and, you know, trial and error, see if, if it works, if it doesn't work, if it's too much or if it's, you know, not what you're going for or if something is supposed to be more melodic and sweet, well, then that's going to be a different visual cue. So it's, yeah, like it's um, it's basically trying to find the bridge between the two languages of auditive and visual. So that's kind of how I went with it. That's really fascinating. You know, I never really thought, uh, but of course, it's true that every any time somebody is making music, they're using their body in a way, and the body is what you're drawing when you're making when you're making art. So of course, you can draw that. That's, that's fantastic. <laughs> Right. <laughs> um, Aureli, I'm going to turn to you next. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit here. Uh, your story, as you have said in your very moving intro, is very personal for you. Um, and I'm curious about why you chose to tell it in a picture book specifically, um, and what you hope your audience will take away from that. Yeah, so never in a million years I thought I would be writing. Um, I went to college to become a teacher, you know, growing up, I was like, I always wanted to be a teacher, especially a bilingual teacher, where we teach both languages to your students. Um, 
our native language and our new language. And so I think the opportunity to write a children's book just came about because um, my writing just landed in, in the right hands. Um, I was in college, I wrote, I, I was in college at Brooklyn College and I finally felt comfortable sharing my story and then I finally felt comfortable writing it down. And I submitted this essay where I talked about my childhood, talked about my experience as an undocumented immigrant and it landed in the hands of Lee Wade. I think she's watching right now. And she gave me the idea. She was like, let's write this into a children's book because there's not a lot of children's book that deal with the experience of a undocumented child. And so that's where the, the idea came about. And so with this book, I really just wanted to focus on the complexities of leaving your home to your home to find a new home. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to show with this book, it's I didn't want to focus on the trauma, even though it is a traumatic story. There's a lot of separation. You know, my parents left when I was two, and then I had to leave my hometown and leave my abuela behind. And so there's a lot of separation, but I also wanted to focus on the lessons and and the good things that came from this, this decisions that my, my parents made for me to move to this country because at the end it was worth it, right? I was able to get a quality, quality education. I was reunited with them. And now I'm a published author, which I had something that we, I would have never imagined in a million years. So um, I think it's so important to have these kind of books. So children, especially immigrant children can see themselves in, in these stories and feel like they belong and know that they're seen and they're heard and that their stories matter too. Um, that's a really good segue into my next question, which is that uh, all of you have careers beyond the books that you have created that we're talking about here today. And I wonder, really specifically, if you, could, if you can speak a little bit about how being a teacher has helped shape uh, the book that you published and the way you think about writing in general. So yeah, definitely as a teacher, um, teachers, we use a lot of books, picture books especially, to help our students understand another person's life, culture, experiences. And sometimes it can be, uh, it could be like a window or um, a mirror, right? A window to someone else's life or a reflection of your own life. And so um, as a teacher, you know, I've often used a lot of books and um, to, to, to talk about these experiences. So um, I thought it was important to talk about immigration, right? We have, um, it's something that our students are going through in their daily lives. We might not know because they might not feel comfortable telling us about their, their situations at home, but there are, we, we will find students that are immigrants themselves or are dealing with their parents being undocumented. And so we wanna make sure that they feel safe in their classrooms. And the way that we do that is through literature, through the books that we present and also, it's as an educator, it's important to know the issues, right? To understand the what's happening with immigration and other issues going on that affect our students. So um, yeah, I definitely, as a teacher, I definitely wanted to have a book that was accessible, right? That could start conversations in our classrooms that would lead for students to feel like they belong. So um, I, I, I hope more books uh, about the immigration experience come out. I hope um, more people feel inspired to share their story. Uh, we need more, more books about immigrants written by immigrants, right? We need authentic stories in our classrooms. Yeah, that's great. Um, so uh, both of you also have careers outside of, out of writing. Um, Carla, why don't you talk a little bit about how your work outside of the books you write has influenced your writing? So I am actually the exact opposite from Marely. I, I'm a, my job, my day job as a finance attorney has not influenced my storytelling in any way. If anything, I think it's the opposite where my alter ego as a children's writer just allows me to infuse a little bit of magic into my day to day. So it's, it's yeah, I'm grateful for this job because it, it really shines my other one a little bit. <laughs> Jose, how about you? Man, I 
just you know, lagging behind on the on, on, on turning on, on the technicals. Um, well, for me, like I, I mean, my my other job is it still involves mostly drawing because uh, my other job is uh, freelance storyboards for either commercials or short films or if there's ever a budget for feature film and things like that. Um, and I mean, out of it's it's a really nice break because you know you know in case anyone is curious like I love to draw is one of my favorite things to do ever like drawing is like drawing was the what was like the dream job right so like it's a so hooray for living the expensive dream uh, so but I specifically came to to Los Angeles because they told me that they made movies here so I figured well I guess I better go and try to make it over there uh, and it's worked out pretty well for the most part because. You know, it's freelance, so you know. Little did I know how much um, how much of the freelance aspect not a whole lot of people told you about of like, you know, self promotion, constant search. You know, like it's a feast or uh, feast or famine uh, mentality, um, and that kind of uh, th that kind of approach. But it's also very beneficial because I get to talk with other creatives. I get to exchange a lot of ideas with fields that that I wouldn't even consider such as for instance like uh, you know talking to cinematographers or talking with with with, uh, with lighting experts or talking with script writers you know like whether we're just having coffee or being on or whenever I get invited to be on set or something like that it's fun and, and informative and I like it but it's also completely different from making comics because well for one in comics I it gets to be the final product right like whatever it is that you draw one way or another, like that's the final result. Whereas in with storyboarding, uh, you are predominantly like the one of just the initial steps in a very long process. So, you know, like the drawings don't need to be super amazing. They just need to be clear. So clarity kind of becomes like a bit of like a, a good signaling of is when it comes into making comics of, is my clarity good? Like, am I being clear with my storytelling? Um, and so on, and little little bits like that. Also, the other thing that I find interesting is that um, both with comics and with uh, and, and with other forms of literature, um, it's a lot slower pace. Like things just take longer. Whereas in with like, with the commercial art side, everything needed to be done yesterday. Everyone is constantly in a rush. There's a lot of hurry up and wait. Um, and you know, like it's. You know, again, it's it's a living, it's fun, it's enjoyable, but it also once I get to go home and or once I get to switch screens, I guess, um, it is very comforting that, you know, with comics, I can take my time a little more, I can rethink things and, uh, you know, and, and at the end of the day, it all comes down to what my editor has to say, hi Whitney. Uh, or what, um, or or whether anybody else has to you know, give, give me any kind of input, whether it's a friend or a peer or something like that. So, uh, yeah, but, I mean, it's it's drawing all day. It's uh, it's uh, it's good. <laughs> um, so each of your books are rooted in and share elements of Latinx and Hispanic culture with readers, but of course there are so many perspectives and stories out there. Um, do you have a message or anything to share to the librarians listening who are looking to celebrate Latinx and Hispanic Heritage Month in their libraries? Um, and Arely, would you mind if we start with you? I don't mind. Um, I think it's nice that we have a month, but I think it, if you have students with Latinx, Hispanic, backgrounds, you should celebrate it the whole school year, right? It, um, so that's my recommendation that try to incorporate it the whole school year. It does, if you can read something in December, January, right? You just wanna make sure that your kids um, feel that um, they're being represented. And, um, and again, using authentic stories, right? Research books that um, tell authentic stories and are told by people with different experiences, right? The Latinx experience is not the same. All of us are different. We have different experiences. Um, and one thing is reach out to your community, right? There's a lot of people in our community that are great resources. Um, and so those are my three recommendations for librarians looking to celebrate Latinx, Hispanic, Hispanic heritage in their, in their classrooms or in their schools. Those are great tips. Uh, Carla, how about you go next? So I 
I'm relatively new as a middle grade author. And so I have been thinking a lot about how I can contribute to this growing legacy of Hispanic and Latinx storytelling. How can I add value, not just for readers who can see themselves in my books, as, as Arely pointed out, but also for readers beyond that, right? And I think it comes down to the stories that we tell about ourselves, the capital S stories, and how those are shaped by our past, by our experiences, by the context in which we come to know ourselves in the world around us. So my contribution, and this is sort of where I invite librarians and author uh, educators and teachers and readers, um, the, the goal of a storyteller like, like me and I think my fellow panelists, we are creating a new context for readers to dive into, to have new experience, to have a new framework in which to see the same world that they see, but through a different lens. And that new context can re reshape us, it can transform us. And so the invitation is, don't just read it to learn about how things are in Oaxaca City or in Puebla or in Mexicali or in whatever, read it to transform, read it to be different, to diversify yourself, not just to read about people who are different than you. I love that, such a great answer. Okay, Jose, your turn. I don't know how I'm gonna follow both of those <laughs> up. So, uh, but, uh, but no, I, I mean, also, I mean, I don't know what I can tell libraries that they don't already know. Cause I mean, I'm tr we're all fans of the library here and also, I'm sure that everyone here has a favorite librarian. I know that I have favorite librarians here in Los Angeles. Uh, so, but no, in regards to the question, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, other than, I, I guess I'll just restate the, I'll state the obvious as well as like, we're not a monolith. So there's all sorts of stories that can come from different places. So paying close attention as into what story is coming from where is really cool. Um, I don't know if, uh, how this may come across, but like, Hey, if there's a book in Spanish and with pictures, that's uh, let's pay a lot of attention to those as well, because that also means that these are two completely different things that these are two completely different languages that can also be a bridge into people into people that are living over here and could I, or can also make the connection. And I don't mean that just for for Spanish speakers. I mean, just for anyone who where I mean, pictures are, you know, a language in, in, in and of themselves, like there is such a thing. And I think that's why a lot of people gravitate towards visual storytelling or comics is because what they can't get through the words, they can get through the pictures. So if there's any books out there that visually are grabbing or visually look interesting and visually look as if it's a place that we've never been before or just something that is new to us, um, let's let, let, let's check that out. Let's see what they have to say because it can be a refreshing or just a flat out expansive perspective that we just hadn't considered. Like, um, and, and again, like I know librarians know this, so I don't know if that's even advice rather than just echoing, um, you know, something that I've heard them mention before. But uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I would say. And also, hooray for more representation and more Latinx literature out there to be. You know, joining the shelves. So. And Jose, I'm going to chime in here because you gave a shout out to LA libraries and I have to shout out to the LA Public Library as well because those those folks are amazing and they do really, really fantastic interviews. So if they're watching, I love you. <laughs> And I know that you, I know that you have your preference for the Chicago librarians, but, <laughs> <laughs> and that's hopeful. Anyways, uh, yeah, so. Yeah, that's a really great point about visuals too. I mean, I, I think that, I, I mean, you're right, librarians know this already, but I think it really bears repeating that the, the power of like visual communication is really important in this, I think, especially for young readers um, who are learning how to use their brains in all sorts of different ways to take in stories. And uh, just because a book has um, Spanish words in it and the, the young reader might not be fluent in Spanish doesn't mean that they can't get something meaningful out of it as well. And they might be able to learn something by taking in the book as a whole, um, which I think is also really important to remember as we're talking about ways to enrich library collections. Um, so speaking of libraries, um, I want you all to imagine that your book is on a library display. Uh, what are the books that are next to yours on your library display? And Aureli, how about we start with you? Uh, there, oh, okay. I thought I was muted. Um, there's so many. So 
first off, I think each time people talk about my book, they mention Yuyi Morales' Dreamers picture book. So I would definitely picture that. I recently found out about um, a, new, a new book, or I don't think it's new, but it's new to me. Uh, it's called America is Her Name by Luis Rodriguez. I think that's a, a great book that would be next to my book. And another one is My Diary from Here to There. And last one for young adults is Someone Like Me um, by Julissa Arce. It's um, a young adult novel. So I think all of these talk about um, the immigration or experience and they all have different perspectives. And I think it would just make a nice collection with my book. Very nice. And I did not put like a, a, a limit on how many books are allowed to be on the <laughs> library shelf, just so you know. You can have as many or as few as you want. Um, Carla, how about we go with you next? What what other books are on a library display with yours? So I guess it would depend on the theme of the display. Um, if, if it's about the forces that influence and try to shape our destiny, then it would probably be near a book like The Night Circus. If it's about finding yourself and, and what you're made of, what you're capable of, then I would love to have it near some books like Manana Land or even When You Trap a Tiger. Um, if it's a book about venturing off into clever lands beyond our borders, then Phantom Tollbooth would probably be a good companion. Um, and then, you know, if it's, if it's about covers and there's just so much, I do want to give a, a shout out again to Dana Sanmar because there's so much beautiful artwork, especially in the middle grade novel. I, I mean, picture books have always have artwork and of course graphic novels, but I'm seeing so much beautiful art in, in middle grade novels and in YA novels. So um, I think that I would just display Dana's work all by itself and just give it its own display. <laughs> I know you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover, but there are some really beautiful book covers that are coming out I in the last few years. It's stunning to see. I am always amazed at how many beautiful book jackets I see. And it's actually one of the things I miss the most about our current virtual working situation is I don't get to hold the, the books with the beautiful covers in my hands and see them myself. Well, and um, what I love about the covers is they're not just illustrating Mm -hmm. the the text right there it, it's telling a story and so you know a cover like Loteria it, it 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 is conveying the emotion and the free will like the concept of free will and determinism and it has all of the symbolism built in so it's 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 a it's another level of artistry that really goes very well hand in hand with the storytelling the textual storytelling yeah yeah it's definitely a skill and and people who can do it well are are very very talented well say we're looking at you yeah, Jose, you're next. <laughs> um, I mean, are we talking like Dream Team? Like, if like it's a because I mean, graphic novels have like their own section in libraries. It can already. be anything that you want. So, any any book you want to have on your library so, display can be there. I mean, I think I would kind of go with like you know, it's, it's a little obvious, but I would go with uh, with other great graphic novels about music or and or being in bands. So like it's a and that that's what I would go with. So just to name a few. Uh, I mean, this is, met, anyways, uh, so obviously Love and Rockets, yeah, <laughs> that would be, because that's like the quintessential, like, Latinx and, and women in a band, like, it's, it's amazing. Uh, so Love and Rockets, for sure. Uh, I've just recently read this book called My Riot that I really loved, that it's also about a teenage girl join, uh, joining a band. Uh, I would love for Suncatcher to be next to that book, because that book is great. Um, Sing No Evil as well. It's also a really fun graphic novel about the same thing, about like how music can be a bit obsessive and it's way more fantastic and, uh, but, it's, but it's a really cool one. Uh, Hope Larson's uh, All Summer Long, I thought was a really beautiful graphic novel that if we could hang out there for like a second, you know, just putting those two graphic novels next to each other, I think would be really great. Um, and, um, you know, just like a, to, to get a little international for, for like a little bit, like, yeah, I think, uh, it, I mean, it's a trade, but it's still really good. It, but it's but it's still a graphic novel. I would call it. Uh, we are the danger. I thought was really cool. So, um, and this is obviously also like a, again, now we're just going in in in, in fan mode. But like, a, if anyone ever makes a not a graphic novelization or a novelization for that matter of the TV show, we are uh, we are we are the we are lady parts. Yeah, I would love for Suncatcher to be next to that. So, 
uh, now now i'm just plugging things in uh but, uh, but yeah that's that, that's where i would go that's great that's great um so i'm gonna uh ask you one quick fire question before we get to the last question here um i want to know what your biggest influences are that aren't books um so Aureli, why don't you go first for this one um i would say my family my family mm -hmm. are my biggest influences um my parents are immigrants who came to this country with absolutely nothing except for their culture, their stories, and they've um, sacrificed so much for, for my siblings and I. So it's my siblings and me. And so I think they've influenced me to just work hard, um, um, to be resilient, to be a hard worker, to, to work hard for my dreams. So I think they influence me every day um, to try my best, to try my, to try to be the best version of myself. So my family. That's great. Jose. Uh, I mean, to say music is a little obvious, but like it's a, uh, but also to say everything is also a bit, you know, would, would sound a little corny, but yeah, I mean, just, uh, I mean, I'm, influence and inspiration can literally come from any place so mm -hmm. I try to remain open as into you know if I if I hear a piece of music or if I'm walking around a particular street or if I listen to a particular conversation it's called eavesdropping but <laughs> uh it's a but you know it's a uh, same thing of like uh, if I'm hanging out with a particular friend and they just happen to be going through a thing and it just becomes like a a thing that it, or an ongoing conversation that can you know bring something up um, but, you know, music, uh, anything that is entertainment, such as animation and or film or people for that matter, it's a, uh, or just, I mean, I walk a lot and go on and, and like to go biking. So just being around movement also, I feel it's, you know, very influential in terms of clearing mm -hmm. out ideas and whatnot. So, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I guess surroundings <laughs> yeah. Yeah. surroundings so that's a good one it's a it's a, it's a word i will you know, I, I would use um, carla how about you what's your biggest influence that's not books yeah i'm gonna piggyback on the surroundings um i've been very lucky to be able to live in many countries and sometimes for extended periods of time so you know six years was our our latest stint in germany and every time we've done this We've, we've made a concerted effort to immerse ourselves, not to stay in our own community, but to really try to inhabit as much of this other community as we can. And I think going back to my point about the stories we tell about ourselves, that has profoundly shaped who I am, how I think, how I view the world, what I think about other people, what inspires me. And so that for sure has been one of the most uh, powerful influences in my life. Uh, the, the international exposure that I've had and, and the people that I've been able to talk to, the, you know, the surroundings that, that I've been able to immerse myself in. That's great. What okay. about you? For me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, um, I, I love food. I think about food like all the time, every day. I love cooking. I love trying new recipes. Um, when I was growing up, we my, my family was pretty poor, so we couldn't travel very much, but my parents would check out every cookbook from the library they could and try to make whatever they could make um, and find as much like wealth of experience within the, the limited space that we found ourselves in. Uh, and I feel like the best way to do that was reading, so which doesn't count because I'm not allowed to say books <laughs> and eating. But that's a great story right there, right? The, the traveling through food. Mm -hmm. and the experience of of going to these different countries just by the recipes that you're that you're eating i love yeah. that yeah <laughs> okay we have time for one more question uh, it's another book recommendation question so what books do you recommend or what will you be reading for hispanic and latinx heritage month uh this is a tip for our librarian listeners specifically uh Arely, why don't you go first on this one um, so I follow a lot of like Instagram pages where they do book recommendations and it's very visual and they show the covers. And one of the covers that I saw recently was for a book called Mona at the Sea by Elizabeth Gonzalez James. And it, it's like very much like Carla. It has the Loteria um, <laughs> in it. And I was just drawn to it because growing up, I played Loteria all the time with my family and it was something that we did 
we did a lot. So I'm definitely looking forward to, to getting that book just, just by the cover. I don't even know what the book is about yet. Like, I just <laughs> saw the no, cover. We're, we're allowed to judge books by covers. <laughs> Absolutely, <now>. yes. Read the book. And um, I also, I think adults can also read children's books. So I'm, I look forward to this book called A Song of Frutas by Margarita Engel, I think. And it's about like um, this girl and her family in Cuba and connecting with her grandfather, I believe. And that's really special to me because I have a very special connection with my abuela. So I definitely look forward to those, those two books. That one's a good one. I, I read that one recently. It's, it's got really musical words to it. I like it a lot. Awesome. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> Jose, how about you? Um, uh, well, yeah, I'm pretty sure you can find like it's a, so there's this book that I really like called Tata Rambo, which is written by, uh, uh, which is written by, uh, by Mr. Barajas, which is all about, uh, activism happening in Arizona. Henry Barajas is the name of the author. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and it's all about activism happening with indigenous people in Arizona. It, it, and, uh, it's really good. Um, I'm trying to remember the title that I should have written down, but like it's a, someone made a graphic novel about the band Redbone. Uh, so <laughs> I definitely want to check that out. But, uh, you know, just to add into the, uh, into the Latinx heritage, like uh, I recommend Quince to everyone, uh, which is a wonderful coming of age story about a, you know, about a girl turning 15 years old and something happens after she turns 15. Mm -hmm. uh, it's on the cover. She turns into a superhero. It's great. Uh, oh my god, I love that. <laughs> uh, a, uh, and uh, there's this really cool co comic out there that I read a couple of that, that I read a couple of months ago, and supposedly it's going to be re-released called "Slowly but Sh by, but Surely," uh, mm. that I found very endearing. But uh, and uh, it's really cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of blanking out on authors, but I'm but, but I'm remembering their titles. So there's a there's a book called Jalisco, which is really cool, and this is a comic series. So they don't have a trade yet, but there's a comic series out right now called Home, um, by uh, by Julio uh, by Julio Anta, which is similar. It's a it's about a it's about an immigrating. Uh, it's about a boy who's immigrating into the United States, and as they're coming into this country, they they also start discovering that something inside of them is awakening uh and it again I don't, I don't i know that i don't mind spoilers but i know that a lot of people do mind spoilers so like it's uh so those are comics that are tied to latinx roots and that i that, that have gathered my that have gotten my attention and that i'm very interested in and i've read some of them but i'm also interested in continuing to read the others uh, tata ramos is another book that has a really great cover yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> Carla, how about you? Why don't you take us home? So I'm actually going to recommend for all of our librarian friends that they check out the Las Musas website. It's a collective of Latinx authors and illustrators. And we have a whole bunch of upcoming releases. And so I will be moderating a panel for the Latinx Kidlit Festival in December on middle grade novels. And one of the, the great pleasures of being the moderator is that I get to read these arcs for some of my fellow panelists. Mm -hmm. So that's what I will be reading. Um, Missing Oakley, The Curse of the Forgotten City, Never Forgotten and Concealed are the next four books on my list. And I'm so excited. It's, it's just, it's great reading. <laughs> that's wonderful. Okay, um, that is all we have time here today. Uh, for today. So thank you again for this wonderful conversation. Thank you also for asking me a question. Nobody's ever <laughs> asked me a question during a panel before. That was really nice. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. You handled it very well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's been a real pleasure to talk to you all. Um, so tomorrow, all attendees will receive an email containing links to today's title list, certificate of completion, and video recording. For more about Booklist webinars, be sure to visit www.booklistonline.com slash webinars, where you can view archives of past webinars and register for upcoming ones like the ones you see here. Patron-friendly, librarian-approved, and free with a Booklist subscription, Booklist Reader, Booklist's new digital-only magazine highlighting diverse readers' advisory recommendations for all ages, launches September 7th. To see and share the latest issue as soon as it publishes, visit booklistonline.com slash reader issues. Not yet a subscriber? Pair the print reading experience with the convenience of online 
convenience of online access at booklistonline.com and lock in print, online, digital, and archive access by taking advantage of this special webinar offer to get booklist for only $75. Thank you again for joining us for today's webinar and one more huge, gigantic, enthusiastic thank you to our panelists and our sponsor, Random House Children's Books. This concludes today's webinar. See you next time.